if, if I. This is the condition, the why, the question mark over each of our lives. If, if I, if I am good enough, if I don't mess up too much, if I go to the right church, if I prove to God my worth, if I pray before I eat, if I read scripture before I sleep, if I do enough good works, if I share the gospel with those who search, if I always give it my best try, if I do the most I can before I die, if, 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 if I. Now the problem with these questioning lines is not actually that you're asking if, but that your if is dependent upon your I. Because if you're trying to provide yourself with an equation that assures you of your salvation and you're trying to use yourself as the standard, the cause, the determinant, the foundation, then all you will ever get out of your internal interrogations to the question, have I finally done enough to receive salvation, will be a resounding negative declaration no, no, you aren't good enough. No, you messed up too much. No, you did not do enough good works. No, you did not prove to God your worth. No, you didn't give it your best try. No, you didn't do enough before you died. If your if is based on your I, then your assurance of salvation will always be denied. And yet, for every single one of us, this is what we've tried to base our salvation on self-evaluation. But all we ever get out of this arrangement is condemnation. That's why you feel lacking, no matter how hard you try, because your if is based on your I. It's why you feel disobedient no matter how often you comply because your if is based on your I. It's why you feel distant, like a misfit, like a second-class citizen. It's why you feel empty no matter how much you supply because your if is based on your I. And your I can never measure up to the standard of God on high. And that's not because his standards are awry, but it's because he is perfect and we always fall short of that prize. And so there is always condemnation for those who are in I. Make no mistake about it, that is a very offensive statement for those who are in I. Now, we know the truth. Those of you that are in Christ who have put your faith and trust in Jesus, the fact that we are under condemnation, the fact that we deserve to die, the fact that we deserve to be separated from God for all of eternity, that's something that has become good news in a sense. That's a truth that is easy to understand and easy to accept because after all, that's, that's how we came to trust Jesus. That's how we came to know him as our savior. We recognized that we were condemned. We recognized that we deserve to die and to spend all of eternity in Jesus. And that very thought is what led us to our knees to put our faith and trust in a savior because there was nothing that we could do to save ourselves. But for anybody that may be here this morning, and honestly, for the majority of people that exist in this world today, for those who are still living in I, for those who are trying to prove their worth to God, for those who are genuinely giving it their best try, and I believe this with all my heart, there are people in this world that want to do good, that live by a set of morals, that love other people, that accept people that are genuinely the salt of the earth in those ways, and they don't make waves, and they try to make a difference, and they try to do things that are right. But as long as you are doing it in and of yourself, dependent on yourself, and as long as you can't fully wrap your mind around the fact that there is a God in heaven that we have sinned against and that the punishment for our sin is death, eternal separation from God in hell. If we cannot fully wrap our minds around the fact that a good loving God is truly going to send people to hell, 
then we are offended by the truth of God's word. And what we just saw on that video is what Paul is proving to us this morning from Romans chapter three. And honestly, it's what he's been proving to us all the way since halfway through Romans chapter one, when he gave us a big, bold declaration statement that said this, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. And then he goes from there to prove that all men are ungodly, that all men are unrighteous. And this morning in his his concluding remarks on this opening argument in the book of Romans, he comes back to that and he says, all are under sin. And then he gives the emphatic statement, there is none righteous, no, not one. And that leads to the title of our message this morning, which is this, Condemnation 101. Condemnation 101. How many of you believe that truth matters? And that it's extremely important that we all have our facts straight about what the Bible says about sin and the judgment that we deserve from sin. These are truths that we must have. These are truths that we must know. Now, I, before I get into the message, I want to frame this in a way that you can understand and hopefully in a way that will help you to fully grasp the importance of this and the heart behind Paul's heart, but more importantly, the heart behind God and how he's trying to communicate this truth. Now, I'm just going to give you an illustration. Some of you I know in here have probably experienced this and have gone through and you know what this is like in real life. But just imagine if you wake up one day and there's something that's just off in your body. I mean, just something's not right. And uh, finally, you decide to go to the doctor and you get some things checked out and they run all kinds of tests and they do CAT scans and x-rays and they do everything under the sun, MRIs, and they discover that something is wrong inside of you. You have, a, you have a disease. You have not just any disease, but it's a terminal illness. It's something that is going to take your life. Now, just imagine if this doctor that, that discovers this and that knows the full weight of the truth, just imagine this guy is a really, really nice, phenomenal person. They're a really nice guy. And because they know the full weight of what they've discovered... But because they're so good and they're so nice, they don't want to hurt your feelings. And they don't want to cause you to have a bad day by delivering this devastating news that they know is going to change your life. And so as a result of that, they fail to communicate to you the seriousness of the situation. How many of you would be deeply offended and upset at that doctor when it's all said and done for not telling you the truth? You understand our God is nothing like that at all. He is a God who is honest, but he's also a God who is loving and kind. And when we get to passages like this, you know what the Bible's telling us? That we have a terminal illness. It's called sin. And as a result of it, we're going to die. And if we don't do something about sin, not only are we going to die, we're going to be separated from God for all of eternity. And the very thing that we were created for, the very way that we can find fulfillment and satisfaction, we will never know because we have sin that is inside of our hearts and sin that is inside of our lives. And the reason why we have passages like this and the reason why they are so fundamentally important for all of us is so that we understand the seriousness of our situation and we don't just run to the cure, but that we will forever stand in awe and amazement that there even is a cure, that there even is hope. And before we can get to the good news, we have to recognize the desperate need that we all have for a savior and for a deliverer. And that's what we're gonna be talking about here this morning in Romans chapter three. So condemnation 101, I've only got two points for you this morning. I've got two points under each point. So I got a lot. Are you all ready for that? Okay. Is everybody awake in here today? Anybody really, really tired today? I am. Okay. I will admit that. I know I've had a busy weekend. I know we had an awesome ladies conference that we had up here and I know there's been a lot going on, but man, I'm, I truly am not just excited about preaching God's word today, but burdened 
that we all walk away with the fullness of what God's trying to say to each of us here this morning. And so we're going to start with some basic objections, okay? Some basic objections. This is our fourth message in one clear argument that I already stated that Paul began all the way back in Romans chapter 1, okay? In verse 17. So this is our fourth message. We've talked about judgment 101. We've talked about wrath 101. We talked about our true identity. And today we're talking about condemnation. And I say all that to say by this point, where we're at in Romans chapter 3, if this is your first day that you're here and you're picking up on this series of where we're at, by this point, it is very clear and very obvious that all men are sinners, okay? He's going to just come back with the final argument and he's going to conclude everything when we get to verse 10, but it's painfully obvious that nobody can escape God's condemnation. Nobody's escaping God's wrath. We all deserve judgment, but... Just like today, back then, not all men are buying it. And so there's some basic objections. Now, in verses 1 through 8, Paul's having a dialogue with an invisible person. But these are questions that have been asked for all of eternity. And I believe, ultimately, Paul answers these questions because these are the very things that stood in his way of coming to know Jesus and why he was one of the greatest persecutors of the church to begin with. So these are things that he's very familiar with because he battled them himself. And I'm going to sum up uh, the multiple questions that they asked with just two main points that I think he's coming at. And here's objection number one, what people will say back towards condemnation. God's not fair. Have you ever heard that from people before? God's just not fair. It's not right that he's going to, is he really, is a good God really going to send people to an eternity in hell? God's not fair. Look at how Paul asks these questions. Look at verse one of chapter three. He says, first, what advantage then hath the Jew? Or what profit is there of the circumcision? The Jews are the ones that are asking this question, okay? He just got done telling them that it doesn't matter if they are physically born a Jew and they are physically born into God's family. None of that matters. That's not the point. You need something greater than that. You need something more than that. So the the Jewish people, the Israelites are now firing back and they're saying, well, if that's the reality, then what advantage do I really have in even being born a Jew? I, there's no advantage whatsoever. And look what Paul says in, um, in verse 2. He answers right back. What advantage then hath the Jew or what profit is there of the circumcision? Everybody read the first three words of chapter 2. I mean, of verse 2. Much every way. By the way, listen, you do have an advantage. Don't miss the point. And then he says this, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. Now, he only gives one answer here, and he's actually going to pick this argument back up later in the book when we get to chapter 9, and he's going to list out a whole bunch of advantages and benefits that came with becoming a Jew. But right now, he doesn't have time for that. And he's saying, for any of you that think that there's no advantage in the fact that you are born as a member of the children of Israel, think again, you have a huge advantage, chiefly that you were given God's word. Word. What he's saying is you're given the law of God. You're given special revelation. Guess what you have? You don't just know about God through creation, but you have been given the answers to the biggest questions in life. Where did I come from? Why am I here? What's my purpose for existing? Where am I going when I die? You have all of that because God has given you his word. You have an advantage. All right, so now they they follow back up. That's not good enough. So look at verse three. Here's a second question that they ask along these lines. For what if some did not believe? Believe. Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? So here's essentially what they're saying. Okay, well, Paul, that's fine. But what if some of the Jewish people, the nation of Israel, what if they truly don't believe in Jesus Christ? And then when God punishes them, and God sends them to an eternity in hell, isn't that going to make God look really bad and really awful because he's sending his own people to an eternity in hell? This is what they're asking here. Just his, his people's unfaithfulness, by the way, his people's unfaithfulness, their, their little sins shouldn't matter, right? Because God's going to look bad if he judges them in the same way that he judges everybody else. And look what he says in verse 4. What are those first two words? Everybody out loud with me. God forbid. God forbid. Yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. What he's saying here is this. Man's unfaithfulness has absolutely nothing to do with the faithfulness of God. Let God be true and every man a liar. We just got done singing an awesome song about the same God, right? 
Man, doesn't that encourage you? Dan, Dan was right. We all have obstacles. We all have mountains. We all have giants. We all have huge things that stand in our way. And all of us are human beings. And sometimes our faith is small, right? Anybody ever struggle? Everybody feel like the enemy is greater than we are? Isn't it good to know that we serve a God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever? That he is a God that is true. He is a God that does not lie. He is righteous and just in all of his ways. Let God be true. God is going to be the same God regardless of how we act. And he's going to be true to himself. And he's going to be true to his word. Whether he's condemning people to an eternity in hell or whether he's inviting them into life everlasting in heaven with him. Let every man, let God be true and every man a liar. Are you ready for some practical application from all of this, okay? God's not fair. Here's some practical application. Don't be offended. Don't be offended. Here's the bottom line. If you're wrong, you're wrong, <laughs> Right? Why is it so hard to admit that sometimes? Anybody else like me? Anybody have a hard time just admitting you're wrong? I mean, you've been nailed and you're still like, but I mean, you got to see it from my point of view and all this stuff. I mean, we just, we can't ever just accept the fact. I mean, if our wives would just understand that they are wrong. I'm just kidding. I'm not going down that way. It's really the other way around. I know it. If you're wrong, you are wrong. Look at verse four again with me. So he answers that question, God forbid, yea, let God be true and every man a liar. And then he says this, as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings and mightest overcome when thou art judged. Whenever he says, as it is written, he's going back to a verse that he's pulling out of the Old Testament. And this happens to come from Psalm 51, verse 4. And in Psalm 51, David has just been nailed to the wall about his sin. We know David as a man after God's own heart. David is one of the greatest heroes in all of the Bible. We sang about the fact that we have the same God as a God of David who went up against the, the giant Goliath. And David did some tremendous things in his life, but David also did some pretty horrendous things in his life. And one of them was this, he committed adultery. And then he, he got uh, Bathsheba pregnant as a result of that adultery. And then he tried to cover it up and he brought her husband home from the battlefield. But her husband was more honorable than David, more honorable than most men. And he wouldn't even go in his house. He wouldn't even go into his wife because how could he go enjoy the pleasures of home and safety and comfort when his men are out on the battlefield? I mean, how many of you agree? That is a noble man right there. I mean, that's unselfish, that's honor, that's dignity that's coming across right there. So David didn't get his problem solved, so he solved it another way, and he sent Uriah out into an ambush, pulled the other men back from him, and essentially Uriah, Uriah was killed in battle. David's able to marry Bathsheba, he's able to cover up his sin, except for the fact that he didn't because God knows and sees everything. And so after time goes by, a prophet named Nathan comes and he calls David out for his sin in a very dramatic way. And in Psalm 51, David knows he has been nailed. He knows that he is wrong. And he cries out to God in verse four. And he says, against thee and thee only have I sinned. And then he essentially says the same thing that we're finding here in verse four, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings and mightest overcome when thou art judged. And basically what he's saying is, is you are just when you speak and you are right when you judge. And no matter what opposition I have against you and your judgments, at the end of the day, I am wrong and you are right. And here's the reality. David's unfaithfulness did not make God look unfaithful. It made God's judgment look even more righteous. Don't be offended. If you're wrong, you're wrong. Just admit it against thee and the only have I sinned. And then here's the second thing I'll say about that too. Get your eye out of the way. Get your eye out of the way. How many of you believe that there are many people in this world, in America especially, that call themselves Christians that, that might not actually be a Christian? Does anybody believe that there's a lot of people who call themselves Christians but don't, might not actually be Christians? I think everybody, there's a universal agreement on that. <laughs> So to anybody, though, that may call themselves a Christian and might be feeling a little bit offended by the condemnation that there is in Christ, or for anybody that, that assumes that they're a righteous person, maybe you ask yourself the same question. Well, what advantage is there to being able to call yourself a Christian? Or what advantage is there to America being able to label itself as a Christian nation? And I would say this, much then in every way. 
If you're even calling yourself a Christian, that means that you have a knowledge of Christ. And you know the most important truths of God's word. You know that a Savior came and was born of a virgin. You know that he went to a cross and that he died and that he rose again. But just knowing that in your head does not automatically make you saved. And do you know what is the difference between heaven and hell for so many people? 18 inches. It's the difference between your head and your heart. And the only way that that can change is if we get our eye out of that way, out of the way. I'll never forget when I was a kid, that was my dad's favorite gospel track. Back then it was a track called Missing Heaven by 18 Inches. It was blue, I'll never forget it. There was like a yellow ruler type thing on the front of it. And that was his favorite track. And I believe that was his favorite track because he was that person. He grew up religious. He grew up knowing about God. He knew about Jesus. He knew about the cross, but he was not a child of God because you see, we are all born into this world in I. And we're going our own direction in our own way. And just knowing about God and knowing about the cross, that's great. But that's not enough if we're just trying to take along that knowledge with us. We've got to believe. We've got to repent. We've got to get to the point where I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I'm condemned. I know there's nothing that I can do. And the only way that I can be saved is if I believe. I turn my life. I say, God, I'm not going my own way. I can only go through you. I need to put my faith and trust in you. And until we know that we have that period of time in our life where we've made that decision and we've made that confession, we are lost and we are under judgment because it's only through Jesus and what he did for us on the cross that we can be saved. So don't be offended. If you're wrong, you're wrong. And that's all of us. And just admit it and get I out of the way and humble yourself and trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior and let him forever change your life in the best way possible. All right, so that's just one objection. God's not fair. Here's another objection. Let's just sin. God's not fair. Well, let's just sin. Look at how this argument goes. Look at verses five through eight. I'm going to read them. You follow along, okay? But if our unrighteousness commend the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous who taketh vengeance? I speak as a man. God forbid. For then how shall God judge the world? For if the truth of God hath more abounded through my lie unto his glory, why yet am I also judged as a sinner? And not rather, as we be slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, let us do evil that good may come, whose damnation is just. Now, how many of you got a little bit lost in all of that right there? There's a lot of words. Let me just summarize this and make this really simple. Here's what they're saying. If our unrighteousness makes the righteousness of God look good, then why not just sin? And they're going back to, again, the story of David. This is where that argument comes from. David was unrighteous, right? I mean, and David cried out to God, but you know what else he cried out to God? Create in me a clean heart, oh God. Renew a right spirit within me. And even though he knew he was worthy of the judgment and damnation of God, he found forgiveness and David's unrighteousness before the righteousness of God. And the fact that he found forgiveness made the righteousness of God look absolutely astounding and amazing. When we sing amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me, that ought to never get old inside of our hearts and lives because our unrighteousness makes the righteousness of God look absolutely astounding. And so here's what they're saying though. This is where it gets twisted. If God is honored by my sin, then wouldn't it be wrong for God to punish sin? I mean, essentially here's how it goes. Doesn't God want to look good? I mean, he wants to look good, right? I mean, he's going to look harsh and cruel and unkind if he takes vengeance on sin. But wow, will he ever look good and amazing if all of these wicked people come before him one day and he accepts them and he forgives them and he lets them in to heaven to be with him for all of eternity. That's where their minds are going. Have any of you ever heard anything like that in our world today? Yeah, you hear this all the time, that type of thinking. And here's the answer to that question. Here's the practical application. Don't be a fool. Don't be offended, but don't be a fool. He asks in verse five, is God unrighteous who taketh vengeance? And then he says, I speak as a man. He's he's embarrassed that he even has to say that. That he would have to think, "Is is God an unrighteous God for punishing and condemning people to hell? 
We ought to be embarrassed that we would ever call into question the righteousness and judgment of God. That ought to embarrass us. That's what Paul says. I, I speak as a man. He's, he's embarrassed by this. And then he says, God forbid. And then look what he says after that. Look at that verse up there. I want everybody to read that last line. He says, God forbid. And then he says what? For then how shall God judge the world? Let's do a little bit better. Here we go. Ready? For then how shall God judge the world? He's saying, don't be a fool and put God in a box that makes no sense. And here's how the argument goes. Oh, yeah. I absolutely believe that hell is deserved. There's a heaven, there's a hell. There's people that deserve to go to hell. Murderers, rapists, people that do horrible, wicked things to children. They deserve the judgment of God. And quite frankly, hell's not enough. They, if there was something greater and more significant than that, then absolutely God is right and God is just in judging them. But all of a sudden, when you turn the mirror and you start looking back on you, you say, but, uh, but to, for me, no. I'm not that bad of a person. I mean, sure, I, I've told some lies and actually, there was, that, there was that one time, yeah, there was that one time where I, I did mess up really bad. I mean, don't get me wrong. It was a big, huge mistake. Still a lot of consequences from that. But I'm really sorry about that. And I got it right. And I've apologized to the people that are in my life. When I get to the end of my life, I've done way more good than I've done bad. God would be unrighteous to judge me, but he's righteous in judging other people. And God is just saying, you can't put me in that box. That's not how it works. He doesn't pick and choose which sins are more worthy of death than other sins. No, all have sinned. We are all unrighteous. And just hold on to this thought because we're going to get there. When we get done with this message today, we are all going to know just how guilty we genuinely are in the eyes of God. And there is no escaping it whatsoever. And so to assume that really bad people deserve judgment, but you don't will set you up to look like a huge fool on the day when you stand in the very presence of God. Don't be a fool. So those are some basic objections. God's not fair. Yes, he is fair. Let's just sin. No, don't be foolish in that. God saved us to change and to transform our lives and to make us into his image and his likeness. And so here's his concluding arguments, and we are going to wrap this up. Look at verse 9. Here he goes. He's jumping right into the final part of this. What then? Are we better than they? Everybody out loud together. What's next? Are we better than anybody else? No. That's a big resounding no in no wise. For we have before proved that both Gentiles and Jews, that they are all under sin. All people are under sin. Sin is the agent or force that has complete control over us. Sin is a cruel tyrant who holds all people imprisoned and guilt and under judgment. Here's what we have to understand. We are not good people who sin occasionally. We are sinful people who occasionally do good. You understand that? We are not good people who sin. No, we are under sin. We are in bondage to sin. And basically the best way that I can summarize that is we all have a monster that's living inside of us. Is there anybody here that would admit this morning? You got a monster living inside of you? I've got a monster living inside of me that I got to fight on a regular basis. I'm just going to confess. The Bible tells us that we should confess our faults one to another. I will confess one of my faults to you. I figured that this morning I needed to clear the air because there is this story that is floating around about me that I blew up at a basketball game and I was kicked out of the basketball game. Can I just tell you I was never thrown out of a basketball game ever in my life, okay? Give me a round of applause for that. I'm a good. No, this, don't actually because <laughs> I'm going somewhere for this. Now, there is a story. There was this, this game couple years ago. And by the way, it all stems from, I am a man that is passionate about justice and righteousness. And if referees are making bad calls, they deserve to hear about it. Bless God, right? We got to stand for truth. Okay. So anyway, that's just a, you all know the ridiculousness of that, but I am a passionate person. I'm a competitive person. And sometimes I get a little bit riled up and pray for my wife. She, I promise you, I'm not, I'm not bragging about my behavior in any way. She grabs my arm. She holds on to me. She speaks the truth into my ear. She's like, you're embarrassing yourself. You're embarrassing me. You're embarrassing God. You're going to hate this later tonight when you get home. Stop what you're doing right now. And she's trying to pull me down. That's kind of our game sometimes. But anyway, 
we were at this game. It was at Calvary, and uh, the refs were terrible, and this is not a joke. They really were. There's a long story to that, and there was this, this, a lot of egregious calls, and at one point, I, there was these moms on the other side from Calvary, and they were going crazy. They had their shoes off. They're, like, banging the bleachers, and they're going nuts, and they're screaming, and this one time, there was a bad call, and I stood up, and I said, you've got to be kidding me, and one of those moms from on the other side of the court looks over at me, and she says, sit down, purple shirt. <laughs> and being the mature man that I was, I looked right over at those moms and I said, You sit down. They were already sitting. Elena grabbed me. She said, You sit down. <laughs> oh my goodness. There's a lot that happened that night. I'm not even telling you the whole story, but there's a lot that happened that night. <laughs> And that's the story. People think I got kicked out of the game. I never got kicked out of the game. Did I embarrass myself royally? Yes, I did. Am I proud of how I acted? No, I am not. I'm telling you this story because to this day, we're friends. By the way, I made things right because Calvary came and played us like a couple weeks later and the coach's wife was the lady that yelled, sit down, purple shirt. <laughs> and she came up to me and she's like, uh, you're the pastor here, aren't you? <laughs> you're also that guy that was wearing that purple shirt, right? <laughs> I was like, uh, yeah, I'm really embarrassed about that, you know, and we laughed and we had a good time. Now, whenever I go back to Calvary, I wear the purple shirt. It's kind of like the scarlet letter. It reminds me <laughs> to stay in my place and to behave myself. And the reason why I bring this up is because I wish I could tell you that I have been cured of that problem, but I know basketball season is on the horizon. <laughs> and I can just tell you this, I am under sin just like all the rest of us are. And there are things that well up inside of you that want to come out. You want to express yourself in those types of ways. And whether it's not being able to control your attitude or your temper, whether it's just complacency, whether it's lust, it doesn't matter. Do all of you understand that we all have a monster that's living inside of us and our buttons might be pushed in different ways, but we all have it. This is the point of he's just trying to get practical here. We are under the full weight of sin. Sin is a cruel tyrant. We are imprisoned by guilt. We are under judgment. And he sums up all of this. We can sum all of this up in two arguments. Number one, no one is godly. No one is godly. Look at verse 10. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Why is there no one righteous? He answers that in verse 11. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. In these next eight verses, every single one of them are pulled from different Old Testament passages and different Old Testament, um, uh, just, just different Old Testament uh, passages. And then this one in particular comes from Psalm 14, verse 2. And you know what it says in Psalm 14, verse 2? The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. And then he says, they are all gone aside. When God looked down from heaven to see if there was anybody that understood and how did they understand? If we understood, we would genuinely be seeking God. But he says he found none. They were all gone aside. And then at the end of this in verse 18, he concludes by saying, there is no fear of God before their eyes. And the main problem that we all have is no one is godly. We don't understand. We don't seek after God. There is none that feareth God in our natural state and in our natural condition. Sin is primarily rebellion against God, not primarily bad things that we do against ourselves or other people. Let me tell you this this morning. It is absolutely pointless to argue that I'm a pretty good person. Because it doesn't really matter if we do good things to other people, but we don't have, or if we do seemingly good things, or if we try to treat other people decently, none of that matters if the most important relationship in our life is not right. What does the Bible say? We are to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Do you love God with every fiber of your being? Do you get up and do you just breathe is the very essence of your being. I want to please God. I want to live for God. I want to serve God. I want to honor God. I want the world to see his truth, his worth, his beauty, and his greatness. And in and of ourselves, that is not natural. And unless God transforms us in a miraculous way through the saving power of the gospel, that does not happen. And even after we're saved, we know more often than not that is not our natural 
heart response. So how in the world could we ever be right? Even if we're right with other people, if we do not have the most important relationship with the creator of the universe, if that relationship is not right. Look what he says in verse 12. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Satan would love for us to get it backwards because that keeps us from God. But when our heart is not in the right relationship with God, there's none that doeth good. No, not one. So there's no one godly, but also there's no one good. No one is good. Look where he goes in verses 13 through 14. This is, to me, this is the absolute brilliance of the Bible. There's no one escaping this. All right, I want you to say some words out loud with me. When I pause, you say just the next word, okay? So verse 13, it says, There is an open sepulcher. With their they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under there, whose is full of cursing and bitterness. No one is godly. There's none that doeth good. No, not one. But do you know where he goes? He doesn't go to the fact that, sure, you don't steal, kill, commit horrible crimes. That's not you. Okay, that's great. That's fine. But you do speak. And you know what he says about our mouths and our tongues? Your throat is an open open sepulcher. The mouth was meant to speak life. The mouth was meant to edify and to build up. But yet because of rebellion towards God and because we live in I, so often when we open our mouth, when we open our mouth to speak, what comes out is death and not life. Our mouth is an open sepulcher. You don't believe it? Look where he goes. Your tongues have been full of deceit. How many times have you lied? How many times have you manipulated the truth? How many times have you manipulated the truth to make yourself look better than what you really are? How many times do we exaggerate the story? How many times do we twist the truth? We are all guilty. We are deceitful. Then he says, the poison of asps is under their lips. Words don't just hurt. They can kill and they can destroy. Words genuinely do hurt. We do so much damage with our tongues. Think about it. How many times have we planned up and delivered the perfectly timed insult? Man, how many times has that, as your spouse gotten under your skin and you waited for the right moment and you just dropped the most hurtful words that you could ever possibly drop? And instead of fixing your marriage and helping it get better, man, all you're doing is just digging that hole deeper and making it harder and harder to get past those hurts. How many times have you seen the look and the light go out of somebody's eyes because you dropped that insult and you said that mean thing and you feel good about it in the moment, but I promise you this, all it does is create death. Our tongues are powerful, the poison of asps. And then he says, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. How much negativity do we spew on a daily basis? Why is it so easy to complain and criticize and hard to be thankful? You know, it's amazing. We can sit here. I often tell our people that come on Wednesday nights, and I have to remind myself this. We could sit here. If I asked for a prayer request, we could probably go 15, 20 minutes with prayer requests. But man, when, when it comes to praising God, it's amazing. We got to like rack our brains. We got to go through the Rolodex. You know what we got to do? We got to sometimes scroll past all the negativity that's just naturally there because of our sinful nature to go and open up our eyes to the truth that yes, there is a lot of good. And yes, there is a lot to be thankful for. But because we are rebels and because we are under sin and because we don't naturally see God, we don't see the good. We don't see the goodness and mercy of God. We just see the misery and the destruction that is all around us and then we open our mouths and yes it's an open sepulcher every time we criticize every time we complain every time we're ungrateful and every time we're unthankful we are not bringing honor and glory to our God and Savior in heaven and we don't need to disguise it under the fact of well we're just speaking the truth so we're aware of it no we have to be careful no one is good look at verses 15 through 17 we don't just speak wicked We act wicked. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. 
and the way of peace have they not known. Their feet are swift to shed blood. You might think, well, I'm not like that. I'm not trying to kill anyone or, or uh, take anybody's life. That's not really the point of what he's saying. When you remove God from the picture, you know what we are swift to do? We are swift to take vengeance on any and every wrong offense that has ever been done to us. And how many people live in bitterness? How many people live in bondage because they want everybody to know how they've been wronged and they're not willing to forgive and just let it go? By the way, we live in a sin-cursed world and unfortunately people say things and they do wicked things towards us. That's a result of living in a sin-cursed world. And because of that, our feet are swift to shed blood. That vengeance that, that rears its ugly head inside of you, that, that idea of wanting to prove your right and to prove your worth and the lengths that we go to sometimes to do that, it's destructive. That's what he says then. Destruction and misery are in their way. There are reasons why we whine and complain and criticize. Again, we live in a sin-cursed world, right? We don't have to look far to find negativity. There are people that probably say and do things that hurt you every day of your life. There are people that are doing wicked around you every day of their life. We don't have to look far. We're surrounded by destruction and we're surrounded by misery when it is about I, especially when it's about I, we can't see anything but destruction and misery. And then he says, in the way of peace, have they not known? Man, when it's about I, there is no peace. This is a silly illustration. The other night we were out for a walk and we had, I forget what night it was, it was earlier this week, but we had an incredible day. It was an awesome day. We had a good dinner with the family that night, had good positive talks around the table. Praise God for that. Um, you know, it was just, we just had a good night. I, I think, oh yeah, Lana made some, she always makes good food. Not, I can act like she doesn't do that, but she made a great meal, even had dessert, ice cream, everything. And we're out, it was just one of, it was just a nice day. And we were out taking a walk. It was Alana, Scarlett and I with the dog and we were going down the street and the night was beautiful. The weather's been cooler. The moon was coming out and uh, we're walking down this new subdivision that's being built. There's no houses or anything out there. We're pretty far from civilization. Not really, but it felt like it. And all of a sudden we heard these coyotes that seemed like they were right next to us just howling as loud as they could at the moon and our dog I kid you not he was more scared than anybody else he turned around back to the house and he was dragging us with him as fast as he could go that dog was scared and I was just reminded I had been studying that whole day for this passage and I was just reminded that even when there is peace there really is no peace now this is in I right we live in a sin cursed world we're surrounded by destruction and misery. We are all reminded that in just a moment's notice, everything could be turned upside down. Just like that, everything could be turned upside down. And it's all well-deserved because we are sinners who fall short of God's glory. And look how he concludes this in verse 19. He says, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law. Everybody read that next phrase out loud with me. That every mouth may be stopped. And all the world may become guilty before God. The whole point of Paul going through all of this in the conclusion, there is none righteous, no, not one. Because when we stand before the judge and we've been presented with facts like this, what can we say? Nothing. In your heart of hearts this morning, what can you really say? There's none righteous, no, not one. I don't care, you can take the best human being that you've ever met in your life and there is still sin and unrighteousness in their hearts and in our lives. There is none righteous, no, not one. And the reason why Paul lays this all out is so that when we stand before the judge, we let go of our arguments, we let go of our complaints, we lay it all down and we just simply say, guilty, I'm guilty as charged. I deserve condemnation. And when we get to that point, then we realize that there's something much better. It's not just if I, if Christ. There is therefore now no condemnation for them who are in Christ. Go ahead and play the rest of that video. But there is good news. There is gospel free to all without price for there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. So let's make a new condition. Let's, 
Let's ask a different why. With the old one gone, let's fly a freshly drawn question mark over each of our lives. Let's ask a new if to replace our if eyes. Let's ask if, if Christ, if Christ was good enough, if Christ loved so much, if Christ died to save his church, if Christ rose to give us his worth, if Christ provided bread of life to eat, if Christ fulfilled the scriptures by crushing death beneath his feet, if Christ performed every good work, sought out those who never searched, died the death we should have died, beat the grave to raise us to life, if, 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 if Christ. Now, the joy within these questioning lines is that our if is no longer dependent on something that we supplied. Instead, the if of our salvation is dependent on the one who loved us so much that he was crucified. So... (laughs) Let's abandon our if eyes and run towards if Christ. Let's move from feeling like I'm condemned to say I'm convinced that neither life nor death, neither heights nor depths, not my own faults or mess ups, not my guilt or distrust, nothing can separate me from the love of God because all my ifs Christ answered on the cross. And so we can ask one final if, and with it, all condemnation is crushed. If God is for us, who can be against us?